It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Sue and the organizers for the opportunity, and it's really gratifying to see so many friends, but also just to see so many people here. And uh, I think that we're, um, having been involved previously in both RSA and the Sclerodema Society, it's really superb to see how things are coming together to hopefully achieve more with the new organization. So I was really pleased to be invited to come and speak. That's always an honor. And then I thought a little bit about what I've been asked to speak on. And I thought, gosh, I'm being asked to, um, to, to really explain to you, do we know the cause of scleroderma? And I thought that is a challenge. Um, what I'm going to share with you is uh, some thoughts about causes and, and processes that occur in the disease. And, some snapshots of progress that has been made and clues that we have. Of course, we don't know what causes scleroderma, but we've made tremendous progress over the, certainly over the last 20 years where I've been involved in doing scleroderma research. And I think that we can start to make some really good um, decisions about trials and things that will lead to progress and hopefully better outcomes for, for patients. So, as Peter said, I, we, we should make our disclosures. And in fact, this is really the first data slide for the presentation because it, I do work a lot with pharmaceutical companies um, who are developing uh, new potential treatments for scleroderma in helping them to understand the disease and to really make the best use of their resources to hopefully move potential treatments into real treatments, and I think that that's really a, a sign that 20 years ago you would not have been able to have a disclosure slide if you were a scleroderma doctor because no one was really interested in doing clinical trials, and now uh, I think it, it's a sign of, of progress. What I want to cover is, first of all, the concept that scleroderma clearly, is, as you all know, is a, a rare complex disease, and I'm going to sort of indicate how that is a challenge, but also potentially an opportunity for research and to try and understand the cause. Um, and what I really want to get across is that perhaps being a, a focus on what is the cause, or in a sense the question that I often get asked when a patient comes to see me, certainly in the first, um, in the sort of start of their journey with scleroderma, why have I got scleroderma? What was the cause? Why did I get it? Perhaps that, that is an important question, but Actually, much more important is how the disease develops, the process that occurs, the processes that occur once it's started, because that's the stage of the disease that we have to deal with and how we can try and, um, uh, uh, and treat, uh, treat patients. So I'm going to start just with the concept that scleroderma is very variable and just a reminder that, of course, the Raynaud's, the, um, the, that scleroderma and Raynaud's UK um, deals with all aspects of the scleroderma spectrum, and that includes, of course, patients who have morphia or the localized forms of scleroderma, and you'll have the opportunity to hear more about that this afternoon with the focus groups um, from dermatology. It deals with patients who have Raynaud's phenomenon, pure vascular problems that occurs in systemic sclerosis, but also can occur in its own right as a major difficulty. But it is when those two processes, the sort of fibrosis and thickening of tissues, occurs together with the vascular or blood vessel damage that we see systemic sclerosis, and, and that's the, clearly the biggest challenge that we face within the, um, within the condition. So if we think about those processes, um, that's the first um, way of really trying to think about what's the cause of, of systemic sclerosis. And we do know, and I'll keep coming back to the theme, that it is a disease that um, is associated with alterations in the immune system. So we all need an immune system to fight infection. And I think increasingly we understand, and I'll come back to the point, that we also need an immune system, for example, to help us to fight cancer. And that's make, helping us to understand that is, is making a lot of advances in cancer therapy, for example. So we need an immune system for lots of reasons to help us cope with the environment and with infection and with um, things that go wrong, if you like, in our own bodies. The other component is the blood vessels, and I've talked about the Raynaud's, but we know that, and, and I'm sure you'll hear from other speakers, that there's much more to the blood vessel damage um, in scleroderma than just Raynaud's. There are the there's the damage that occurs in the small blood vessels that you can see that helps you to make an early diagnosis, and there's the damage that occurs in the large blood vessels that can lead to complications like kidney failure or pulmonary hypertension. And then there's the 
part of the disease that many doctors really start with, and they often think that scleroderma is just a fibrotic disease, and they sometimes don't appreciate those other aspects, and that's um, obviously important in terms of causing thickening of the skin, but also in the internal organs, and especially lungs and lung fibrosis. So th there are those three processes that we would say, well, those are, if you like, in one way, the cause of scleroderma. Things have gone wrong in all of those different processes and, and how they, they sort of link together. And I'll come back to that uh, at the end of the talk. But we've also got to understand that if we're thinking about what causes scleroderma, we have to think, well, why does it affect different patients in different ways? And again, in addition to just thinking about the different types of scleroderma, there are different patterns even when you get a form such as systemic sclerosis. There are patients who have more um, vascular damage and less skin involvement, those that might be uh, termed limited scleroderma or limited cutaneous scleroderma, what is sometimes called Crest syndrome. And of course, there are patients who have the much more diffuse form of fibrosis, the diffuse form of scleroderma. And indeed, we know that about one in five patients, and this is something that helps us to really uh, appreciate how important the links are with other branches of rheumatology, um, that they have a, another rheumatic disease as well. They might have lupus or myositis or arthritis, and, and that's an important challenge. So we look after many patients in our center at the Royal Free, and this is just a snapshot of the patients that we've seen in the last couple of years. So um, we're very much um, uh, uh, giving priority to what we call a shared care model, and, and Peter Lanyon sort of suggested this was perhaps an important part of the future management of scleroderma, and I think it, it, it is, because it, by sharing patients, we can have specialized services linked to a specialized scleroderma center, but as much as possible can be delivered and done in your local hospital. And so that's how we're able to look after, as you can see, well over 1,700 patients that come and see us regularly with scleroderma. And when we look at those patients, we can see that every patient is a little bit different, and you can really um, sort of categorize patients in, 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 in different ways. Um, of course, we know that scleroderma is predominantly uh, a, a female disease. We know that, that uh, more than 80% of the patients we see are female, but we can also classify it in other ways through the autoantibodies that I'll, I'll show you in a minute, uh, as I said, through whether you have another rheumatic disease as well, um, and of course, how it's affected you in terms of the internal organs, whether you've got heart problems or kidney problems or lung problems, um, uh, or indeed, whether it hasn't affected the internal organs. So I'd just like to dwell for a little bit on the autoantibodies, because if we're thinking about the cause of scleroderma, we definitely need to think about what's gone wrong in the immune system. And one of the clearest pieces of evidence that something has gone wrong in the immune system is that almost all scleroderma patients have in their blood uh, an autoantibody, an antibody that shouldn't be there, that binds or recognizes proteins that are in the um, normal cells. We don't think necessarily that those antibodies are damaging the cells and causing the disease, but they are very important markers of the condition. And you can see the different patterns that you look, if you look in the laboratory, at the different antibodies have um, in scleroderma patients. And this is important because when we're trying to understand the disease, we can often link those different antibody patterns to different complications that occur. So it's important to think about the antibodies as we're thinking about what um, is determining progression, and that's proved to be very important in terms of understanding um, uh, the biology of scleroderma, because we can link, for example, the, um, the antibodies to uh, the genetics that control your immune system. So as we heard previously, scleroderma is not a genetic disease, but it undoubtedly has a genetic component, and one of those components is that, the genetic, that you inherit aspects of your immune system that determine whether or not you can develop these autoantibodies. But all of that really was just a sort of backdrop to the main question that I wanted to try and address with the, in the presentation, and that is, what is the cause and mechanism of scleroderma, and what are the new insights that we might have into that um, if someone were to ask us what causes the disease? So, I've given you that landscape of what scleroderma is, and that immediately tells us something about what causes it, because what it tells us is that we know that, the, that most of the patients that get scleroderma are female, so it's very likely that some aspects of what causes it are occurring more frequently in, in women than in men. 
We know that it is rare, and we know that on average it affects about one in 10,000 individuals in the United Kingdom, and in fact in, in other countries as well. So that immediately tells us that whatever causes scleroderma, it occurs infrequently or rarely. And so it is very unlikely we're going to come up with a single cause that occurs I I in every patient. And we also know that although it can start at almost any age, the most frequent times that systemic sclerosis develops are between the ages of 30 and 60. And that does tell us as well something because it, it, it tells us that we know that our bodies and our biology changes uh, as, we, as we get older and as we age. And the fact that the disease tends to occur when you're, if you like, a, an adult or a mature adult means that, again, there must be things that are happening that occur then that allow this one in 10,000 event to, um, to develop. So what we think in scleroderma is that you probably do have to be susceptible to it, that not everyone can get scleroderma. You have to be special in some way. And I think one part of that being special is probably linked to your immune system and that your immune system ability to develop a response that can contribute to scleroderma. But there are many other um, genetic aspects, and I will come back to that in a minute. But we think once you're susceptible, not everyone gets it. This one in 10,000 event has to occur, and then you might start to develop scleroderma. So we think that there is often a triggering event. And in fact, if it's one of the questions I like to ask patients in the clinic is, um, what do you think might have caused the scleroderma? They often ask me what causes it, and I sort of turn the question around in a way and say, well, did anything strange happen to you in the 12 months before you develop scleroderma. And that's where we often go on a bit of a journey and you find that there are sometimes are things that have happened, whether it's emotional stress or a bereavement or a divorce or uh, an exposure to a funny chemical or an illness or you know, many things happen to all of us in our lives. And, and some of those things probably are involved in triggering complex diseases if you have this susceptibility. And I'll show you a few examples where we do have a clearer idea about the trigger. But once you've started to develop scleroderma, to me, this is where the, the sort of very important issues arise uh, uh, for patients and also for doctors looking after patients, because it's not actually, that's not the critical step. It's really what happens once you get it in terms of how does it develop or progress. So the question is, what um, is what triggers the progression of the disease? So it's something's triggered it, but uh, what, um, what determines whether, you, uh, whether it actually progresses from very mild scleroderma to a more severe form of the disease. And those factors also probably depend on things that we come into contact with the environment, but they also may be determined by our genetics. So um, uh, it's quite possible that there are not simple things that we inherit that determine whether we get scleroderma, but there are certainly maybe things that we, that are unique to us that are genetic that determine what happens once it develops. So, um, so we just got to here. Um, <coughs> so it's really what, what you know, you've, something triggers the disease and then other things determine whether it stays mild or whether it progresses and becomes more severe. And then more importantly is how does it affect you over the long period of time? Does it start to affect the lungs or the kidneys or, um, or the bowel in a particular way? So all of those things are relevant if we think about what is the cause and, uh, and, and um, basis of scleroderma. So I think although scleroderma is not an inherited disease in a simple way that you pass it on in the family, we do think that like many complex rare diseases, there is a genetic component. And that genetic component determines firstly whether you might be susceptible to scleroderma or maybe to another rare disease when you uh, uh, are exposed to the appropriate trigger or environment. And then the second is that we think those genetic factors can influence what happens to you once you develop the disease. And I'll show you some examples of that. So, We've had a lot of investment in research over the last 20 years in many, many diseases, and that inclu includes in scleroderma. We had much from uh, the RSA and from the Scleroderma Society um, to support genetic studies in scleroderma, as well as other organizations. And these have helped us to understand a little bit more um, about what may be uh, uh, determining the development of the disease. This is a summary um, picture taken from a recent review article from one of the experts in the field that we collaborate with, Javier Martin, who's based in Spain, but is really expert at genetics in autoimmune diseases and has got a lot, uh, you know, we've developed a large interest in 
in scleroderma genetics. And this summarizes all of the different um, genes that have been identified, not as the cause of scleroderma, but factors that can influence the development of it once it occurs. And what's interesting is it starts to also um, come back to these antibodies that we see different genetic factors seem to be important for patients with different antibodies or different patterns of scleroderma. A few years ago, and this is a nice example that I wanted to share with you because it's something that the Scleroderma Society funded through one of their research grants, but these projects take a number of years to reach fruition, and so we're just starting to be able to analyze and interpret and hopefully present these results. So we know that about one in 10 patients with diffuse scleroderma will develop a specific problem, and that is a scleroderma renal crisis. They'll get high blood pressure, they can get kidney failure. This is a success story in the sense that now we have much better treatments for this. It used to be a, condition, a complication that was almost always fatal, unfortunately. Now, most patients survive and uh, do much better with this condition. But it's nevertheless a really important medical emergency when it occurs, and it can occur out of the blue. Um, well, we know that it only occurs in 10% of patients, so one of the thoughts we had was maybe there's a, there are genetic factors that determine whether or not you might get a scleroderma renal crisis. So we already knew that there was an antibody that associates with renal crisis, and that's this anti-RNA polymerase antibody, one of the antibodies I showed you earlier. What we designed was a study um, that really used this very specific association of this anti-RNA polymerase antibody uh, with renal crisis to, in a very elegant way, we think, try and dissect out what might be the genetic factors that determine whether or not you get a renal crisis. And the reason we could do that is that renal crisis doesn't just occur at any time. It only really occurs in the first three years of your disease. So we know that anyone who has this antibody is at high risk. But if they haven't developed the renal crisis in the first three years, it's pretty certain that they won't ever develop it. And so what we decide is we take 100 patients with this antibody, and we'd have 50 patients who'd had a renal crisis and 50 patients who hadn't. And what we reasoned was that it was likely that the gen their genetics may have protected those 50 patients who might otherwise have had a renal crisis. And we thought we might be able to identify genetic factors that protected them. So this was our vision a while ago. And, um, and it took time to do the study. But we did, and we did use modern genetic approaches to screen the whole of the um, uh, the whole of the genetic makeup to look for factors that might be associated. And we start, and we found uh, a series of genes that did seem to be associated. And this was an important start. And I'm not going to show you more of the results, but we're presenting these results at the rheumatology conference in America in November, um, because what we found was two genes that do seem to be associated with this risk. Um, one of them was a gene that had been associated with high blood pressure in the general population. So that was very interesting. It had not previously been suspected in scleroderma. And another one was this gene, which is a gene for a form of, of catenin, delta catenin, which links into one of the signaling pathways. But what was very interesting is when we look at kidney samples from scleroderma kidney biopsies, we found that this protein was increased in the kidney biopsies in scleroderma, and that had never been suspected before. So this seems to be something that's very important. While we were doing this, we kept our eye on the medical literature, and we were intrigued to see that, in fact, in a separate study from a scleroderma pulmonary hypertension, this very same gene had come out as a factor. And so we think this, again, gives some independent um, uh, sort of suggestion this might be important. So we think genetics are important, but in a complex way. But what about these triggers? And I said that I think for many patients there must be a trigger, but we often don't know what it is. But sometimes we do. And historically, vinyl chloride monomer was the first chemical that was strongly associated with scleroderma. And this was an important industrial problem. Fortunately, now with modern protective clothing and caution, this has pretty much disappeared as a problem. But for a while, there were a number of cases of scleroderma triggered by uh, workers being exposed to vinyl chloride monomer in PVC manufacture. More relevantly, we see patients who sometimes are exposed to other chemicals. So we see that sometimes in patients who've had cancer chemotherapy. They have treatments that may be very effective for the cancer, but sometimes they can trigger features of a condition like scleroderma, and, and this was the case for this, um, uh, this patient here. And these pictures are 
from a patient who worked in a, a man who worked in a machine, an engineering machine shop. And very interestingly, they got their metal components in from abroad. They happened to come from China. One batch that they got had this very strange smelling solvent on them. They don't know what it was. But interestingly, two people who worked in that engineering um, factory within a month developed features of scleroderma. And, and this unfortunate man developed very severe scleroderma. Um, presuming, therefore, that he had this sort of genetic susceptibility and then something was able to trigger the cause. So that slide also introduces something I want to build on, which is the growing understanding of a potential link in some patients between cancer and scleroderma. And this is something that is relevant because it comes back to that point that I made about the immune system being very important um, in, uh, in fighting tumors potentially, as well as fighting infection. It is something that is perhaps appreciated much more now than it used to be. So some workers in America at Johns Hopkins University, where they have a large interest in scleroderma, noticed that there was an association between some patients who had scleroderma and some patients who had breast cancer. And they noticed that the breast cancer tumors in those patients were expressing the antigens that are recognized by those antibodies that I showed you earlier, in specifically RNA polymerase, um, that antibody associated with, with renal crisis. So we were interested in that, and we went to look at some of our patients, and we found that we also had patients who had breast cancer and scleroderma. So we obtained a biopsy for this, the sample from one of those patients, and we stained it for the, um, for the polymerase um, protein um, with an antibody. And what you can see is that the uh, breast cancer is expressing very high levels of this uh, protein, polymerase. So interestingly, what we think, and, and the American uh, researchers went on and did some very elegant work that showed that the tumors start to express some of these proteins, and in fact, the immune system tries to fight the tumor, and sometimes that fighting the tumor triggers an autoimmune response that then evolves into a condition like scleroderma. So we collaborated then with, um, with the Johns Hopkins group, and we looked at our very large cohort of scleroderma patients, and we were able to confirm that in a large group of patients, that is exactly the case, that although you, it's a very small number of patients who do have cancer and scleroderma, that actually, when that does occur, it much more often occurs um, with this polymerase antibody, and the two conditions often occur around the same time. So it, it seem, does seem likely that there's a link. So that was interesting for that antibody, but it then raises the question, well, maybe that's true for other antibodies. And I'm going to share with you just a couple of slides from a patient that I presented when I did the Hebden round um, for the British Society for Rheumatology at their conference um, earlier in the year, because this was a, a, an example that you can sometimes cure a scleroderma patient, um, but it also is uh, an example of how cancer and scleroderma might be linked, as I just showed you. So this was a lady who came to see me who lived in the Channel Islands, 43-year-old lady who developed a, one of those overlap syndromes I talked about because she had scleroderma, but she also had inflammation of the muscles or myositis. So she came to see me in my clinic as a, for advice about treatment. I shared her care with Professor Wolf, who was a, a rheumatologist who was working and seeing patients in, uh, in the Channel Islands. And she had a fairly typical case of scleroderma and myositis, but there were some things that concerned me. Um, she had an anti-PMSCL antibody, so not the polymerase, but another antibody. But she also had some features in her skin that I'd recognized also in other patients where they'd had cancer and scleroderma. So I was very suspicious that she might have a cancer, although there was no um, sort of evidence for that. But I did prompt her local specialist to do more m investigations. And what happened, in fact, is she went to have a series of scans, um, MRI and, and, and CT scans, and indeed, Quite unexpectedly, she had a tumor in, the, um, in her pancreas. And I thought this might be linked to the antibody into the scleroderma. And so um, we discussed it with the surgeon and, and um, uh, Mr. Abu Hilal in Southampton, who's an expert in this area, removed the tumor. It was a big operation, but she did very, very well with it. But what was really amazing is that a few days after she'd had the operation, she started to feel better, and she was able to stop all of the treatment that she'd been on for her scleroderma, and she's essentially almost gone back to completely normal health. Um, so what that told us was that sometimes 
at a certain stage, if a tumor, for example, is driving the start of a scleroderma process, if you remove the tumor, you could be cured. And that's something that hadn't really been observed before, but I think in this case, because it was so early, that was what we saw. So we did, again, look at our large group of patients, and we found that this actually isn't unique. Although it's a much less frequent occurrence, we see that same antibody occurring in some tumor patients. In, um, uh, and indeed, we got the tumor sample from, from, uh, from this patient, and we again, we were able to stain it and show that the antibody was there. So I've just really given you a couple of examples of triggers for scleroderma and of the understanding we're trying to make of genetics in scleroderma. And really just to understand that I think we probably in scleroderma, what we're looking at is a disease that has, if you like, repurposed or taken processes that are normally very helpful, like the immune system or wound healing, scarring, scar formation when you injure yourself, and it's turned it into a nasty disease. And so I think it is important to understand that because when we're trying to then determine how um, to try and understand the disease, we need to probably look at the factors that regulate those normal processes like wound healing and skin scarring. It's something that we can do now in the laboratory by taking skin biopsies and looking at the proteins and genes within the skin, and that's been done now by a number of groups around the world. This was some of the first work, again, led by some researchers in the United States by um, Michael Whitfield and colleagues, who found different patterns of expression of genes in the skin of scleroderma patients, and we're able to confirm what we'd suspected for a long time, that a protein called transforming growth factor beta, which is very important in scar formation, seems to be very important in driving some of the severe forms of scleroderma. So again, because we work very internationally, and I think that's a very important part of teamwork in research, we linked up with Professor Whitfield, and we did some studies with him on some of our patients with scleroderma, but we thought it would be very interesting to look at the patients with limited scleroderma because it's much commoner than diffuse scleroderma and is often a little bit neglected. So again, we were very pleased to be able to do this with um, support from the patient organizations. And we did these genetic studies, and what we were able to show is that indeed, some of those genes that are associated with uh, the skin in diffuse scleroderma are also altered in limited scleroderma and seem to be associated potentially with blood vessel damage, which is a theme you're going to hear about later. So I'm going to conclude, really, with the concept that we don't understand the cause of scleroderma, but we do start to understand what are the processes that occur, what are the proteins that are abnormally expressed, how do the different forms of the, um, of the disease in the immune system, the blood vessel, and the scar formation, how do they interact? And what's important is that we can start to come up with a list of things that we think are very important in regulating that, and these might be things we could block as new treatments, and indeed that's what's happening. And so the companies that I showed you that are working on new treatments for scleroderma, many of them have drugs that block different factors that might be important. And we think that in that way we might be able to normalize the abnormal process that's occurring in scleroderma, even if we don't understand the fundamental trigger or cause in most patients. So we do think that the blood vessels are very important, but they somehow link with the immune system and with the fibrosis. But we think if we could normalize the biology um, of, of these processes, we could, um, we could make a big difference. So I'm going to finish there. But just to f uh, say that I think that um, scleroderma is a very complex process, but I hope you understand that really over the last few years, we've made tremendous progress in understanding the sorts of things that are important as the disease develops that's helped us to identify new potential treatments. So I will finish there, and um, uh, thank you very much for your attention.